I'm at Sandal Castle in the humble city of Wakefield and it's here that British history was changed forever. It's time, of course, for the Battle of Wakefield. Churches, banners, kings and queens, factories and big machines, castles, forts and in-betweens, the stories that are told. Before we get into the battle, it's important to first take a little bit of time to understand why the Wars of the Roses happened, so that's what we're going to do first. And I apologise beforehand because it is quite complicated, but we're going to start with Henry VI. He came to the throne at just nine months old when his father, Henry V, died, but he was an incompetent king. He was plagued with mental illness and a domineering wife, and his courtiers were soon beginning to get tired of him. One particular bone of contention was his failures during the expensive Hundred Years' War with France. For example, in the last 25 years of the war, when Henry VI was king, England lost every major battle and all the land that his father had fought so hard to gain. Two of his courtiers especially began to vie with one another for power. One was Richard of York, the father of Richard III, and the other was his cousin, Edmund Beaufort, 2nd Duke of Somerset. York wanted an aggressive foreign policy to recapture the territory lost in France, whereas Somerset wanted to pursue peace. In addition, both men had claims to the throne. King Henry was childless, and so both men now had the opportunity to make themselves heir. York had arguably the stronger claim, stronger than that of even King Henry, as York was the great-grandson of Edward III through both his mother and father, whereas Henry was only on the throne because his grandfather, Henry IV, had usurped the throne from his cousin Richard II in 1399. Henry VI, then, it could be argued, was illegitimate, and his throne all to claim for. These two men vied with each other for power, and in 1453, Henry suffered a complete mental breakdown, and York was made Lord Protector. But 18 months later, Henry was sane again, and what's worse, his wife Margaret of Anjou had given birth to a son, thus dashing any hopes Richard had of becoming king if Henry died. York was removed as Lord Protector, but was determined to get rid of Somerset. In 1455, he kicked off the Wars of the Roses with the First Battle of St Albans, in which Somerset was defeated and killed. Having established the important bits preceding the battle, I'm going to skip forward a bit for brevity's sake to get to the main bit. In 1460, York entered the Houses of Parliament and demanded the throne, but he wasn't given it. He was made Lord Protector and promised the throne when Henry died. The king was forced to submit to his own son being disinherited from the throne, but his wife wasn't having any of it and was determined to stop York from ever becoming king. Queen Margaret and her son joined powerful Lancastrian nobles in North Wales and gathered their troops. Lancastrian soldiers were recruited from Wales, Scotland and the West Country, which is always rather satisfying to say to people who rather foolishly believe that the wars were between Yorkshire and Lancashire. Many of these Lancastrian nobles were sons of those killed at the First Battle of St Albans, and they wanted revenge for their murdered fathers. They rallied at Hull and camped at Pontefract. At the same time, York marched to his residence at Sandal Castle in Wakefield, just eight miles west of Pontefract. His army numbered anything from around four to nine thousand men, and he underestimated the strength of the Lancastrians, who had around fifteen to eighteen thousand. York was staying in his castle with his army, and yet, instead of staying here and building up a good defence, he decided instead to march out and face a Lancastrian army in open battle. Why did he do this? Why did he make such a costly error? Well, it's a question which has plagued historians ever since. There's a few reasons. One of which is that he didn't have the supplies to last a long siege, and with this being December, it wouldn't exactly be easy to scavenge food from the surrounding areas. In addition, whilst part of the Lancastrian army was positioned outside the castle, a lot of it was hidden away, leading York to underestimate the total enemy strength. Whatever the reason for his leaving, and despite the urgings of his nobles to the country, on that crisp December day he marched out with his army. They marched down here, down Many Gates Lane, heading for the Lancastrians who were deployed in the front of the castle. This is Castlegrove Park and it's the site of most of the fighting. 
The initial Yorkist attack took the Lancastrians by surprise and they fought with tremendous ferocity, but it wouldn't be long before the sheer weight of numbers against them would start to overpower them. The turning point in the battle came when the remaining Lancastrian forces charged out of their positions and slammed into the flanks of the Yorkists. It must have been total chaos. The army was in disarray, it was cut off and slowly cut to pieces and the Duke of York must have come to a very sticky end. And you get a tremendous sense when you're sat here that 600 years ago under your feet the field was strewn with the bodies of the dead and dying. York's 17 year old son Edmund tried to flee over this bridge but was chased down and killed. It said that he was killed by John Clifford whose father had died at the hands of the Yorkists in the first battle of St Albans. This is one of the trademark features of the Wars of the Roses, a constant, endless, bitter cycle of bloody revenge. The heads of the three Yorkist commanders, Richard of York, his son Edmund and Richard Neville, were cut off and hung on Micklegate Bar in York for all to see. The deaths of his father and brother had a tremendous effect on the young Richard III and of course his brother, the soon-to-be Edward IV, took up his father's claim to the throne and fought in the most bloodiest of battles, the famous Battle of Towton in 1461. Edward IV dedicated this chapel on the bridge to the memory of his father and brother who died in the battle. It's one of only four surviving bridge chapels in England. This has been Yorkshire's Hidden History. I hope you've enjoyed and hope to see you again soon.